This is a powered wheelchair. This is a trackless dark ride. This is a powered wheelchair. And this is a trackless dark ride. But what if... I've seen others build at-home dark rides that drive around a track at a constant speed. All it was was a motor hooked up to a battery. I want this product to be much more than that. I'm building a trackless dark ride that's dynamic and exciting. I chose a trackless system because it'll be easy to set up, easy to store, easy to move, and extremely versatile. It can be set up in any space with no modifications to the room, without building a track, and very quickly. And the path that it follows will be able to double back, cross over itself, or even change with rider interaction. No at-home dark ride I've seen has had the control system for that to be even remotely possible. Luckily, I'm a controls engineer and programmer. I have experience working at Universal Creative, working on ride and show control systems, as well as tons of experience working in controls outside of themed entertainment. <laughs> So I got this powered wheelchair off the free section of Craigslist. Everything was there. It even came with the instruction manual. I'll be referring to the wheelchair as the ride vehicle now. So I started this project by tearing down the ride vehicle. One of the things that the Craigslist ad mentioned is that the batteries were bad, which they unfortunately are. I refilled them with distilled water and put them on the battery reconditioner, which made them just barely good enough for now. I will need to replace them, but they what I have and they work for now. Once I had it apart, I tried to take a 3D scan with just a camera and a million pictures. It turns out that there is actually a reason they sell 3D scanners. Who knew? So with basically all the mechanical design of the ride done for me by Dalton Medical, let's talk about the control system. Basically, the control system on the ride vehicle has two jobs, to track the location of the vehicle and then drive the vehicle along a predetermined path. To track the location of the vehicle, I've included two types of sensors on board, a LiDAR sensor here and a wheel encoder on each of the wheels. The LiDAR sensor on board works just like the one on a self-driving car. It's a laser distance sensor attached to a spinning mirror. This allows the vehicles to get distance readings in all 360 degrees. With this, the vehicle will be able to see the walls around it and determine where it is. Now this isn't what Disney uses on their trackless dark rides. Typically, those types of rides have what's called an RFID puck system embedded into the ground. This means that there are thousands of RFID tags embedded into the ground of the ride space, each with an exact known position. Then the ride vehicles just read the RFID tags as it drives over them and they know exactly where they are. I'm not doing this because it requires extensive modification to the ride space, which I'm trying to avoid with this to make it quick and easy to set up. With my LiDAR system, there is no need for any modifications to the ride space, but it does come at the cost of accuracy and speed of location tracking. Another drawback of the LiDAR system that I'm using is that only one vehicle can be on the track at a time. If two vehicles come within line of sight, they would ruin each other's localizations by disturbing the map. The vehicles won't be able to see the walls, and thus they won't know where they are. I ended up getting my LiDAR off Amazon for like 40 bucks. It did come with English documentation, and it's been working great so far. The wheel encoders I'm using are these AS5600 magnetic rotor encoders. I chose magnetic encoders because they are very precise and have no contact, there's nothing to wear out. They work by sensing the rotation of a magnetic field over the integrated circuit, and that's communicated back to the microcontroller. Having chosen the encoders I'm going to use, I had to find somewhere to mount them. One option is to mount on the outside of the wheel, which would require some sort of mount going out over the wheel and expand the footprint of the whole vehicle. The other option is to replace the brakes with encoders. I did worry that this would make the wheelchair roll when people are getting on and off. In this test with the brakes on the vehicle engaged, you can see that when I push it, the wheels lock up and skid. But when I disengage the brakes, you see the wheels roll a bit. I was worried about this until I realized that A, the vehicle barely rolls, and B, I can just actively maintain the position of the control system. Now the brakes are mounted really close together, so I need to make sure that I make the mount for the encoder fit in the same amount of space, including the wiring. So. 
Keeping that in mind, I made a first prototype that definitely did not fit inside the space of the brakes. So actually using my brain on the second version, I made it fit. I am using one microcontroller per motor. The microcontroller reads the encoder and varies the voltage applied to the motor to maintain a constant speed and drive the vehicles. So with the broad overview of the control system, let's look at the electronics that make it all work. While this may look complicated, it really isn't bad when you break it down into functional groups. Also, I lied about the mechanical design all being done. I had to build these supports for the electronics, but that barely counts. This is the power distribution of the electronics, which includes a main disconnect switch to power all the electronics off, a fuse block for safety and power distribution, and a voltage regulator to bring the voltage from the two batteries down to five volts for the electronics. This is the controller for the left motor, and this is the controller for the right motor. Each motor includes a Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller to do all the computation. This board was not fun to solder. Each motor driver also includes a current sensor for safety, as well as an IBT2 motor driver that actually varies the voltage to the motor. The wires from the encoders on the motors come up here and connect to the Pico. And finally, this is the LiDAR, and this is the main computer aboard the vehicle. It is a Raspberry Pi 4B, an older version because it happens to be the one I already have. To communicate between the motor drivers and the main board, I'm using CAN bus. I chose CAN because it's used in automotive and industrial environments, as well as being very easy to implement. Another reason for using CAN is that it's deterministic. You can always guarantee that a message will be sent and received within a time period. This isn't always true for every communication system. Technically, Ethernet on its own is not deterministic. For a vehicle in motion, it's important that we can guarantee deterministic communication. We need to be able to kill the motors. For CAN bus communication, I'm using these MCP2515 breakout boards. These boards come configured for five volts but the microcontrollers in the motor drivers and the main computer all run at 3.3 volts. To fix this, I made this modification to have the MCP2515 powered by 3 volts, but still drive the CAN bus at 5 volts. I covered the solder joint in hot glue for electrical protection and strain relief. I don't really like using hot glue here, but it's no worse than potting. Some tips for any project like this where you have lots of connections that are soldered and crimped. Draw a schematic, follow it and update it, and then perform a line to line. A schematic is easy enough. All you do is draw lines between every component, every pin that needs to be connected. These represents the wires. I use KiCad because it's easy and free. When you are building the electronics, follow the schematic and update it if you find any years. I went through like three revisions of my schematic while building it. Then when you're building the electronics, follow your schematic, Make sure every line is connected. Make sure all your wires are good. And then before you power anything on, do what's called a line to line check. This means using a multimeter on the continuity setting and checking every connection on your schematic. I will now demonstrate the sound of my people. This three-step process is how we do it at professional control shops, and this is how you'll make sure you don't catch anything on fire. So with all that, let's spin these motors up. I have the system powered up and the motor driver's ready. When I run this script on the main computer, the Raspberry Pi, on the vehicle, it'll start both motors, It'll test spinning them, it'll test faulting them, it'll test automatically resetting them, it'll test spinning them up again.
So to recap, this is the computer communicating with the motors via CAN bus, telling the motors to spin up, and then reading the position and velocity back to the main computer. Thank you for watching this video about my at-home dark ride. Subscribe to be notified when I release the next video about the software that will make this ride work.